afternoon, and uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Takaji, for uh, inviting me uh, to Japan, to your foundation, and I think it's a very good omen that the first time I'm coming to Japan is at the invitation of your foundation, which has had a history of cooperating with the Woodrow Wilson Center for uh, many years. And I'm delighted that uh, Ms. Sakashi has accepted to be the moderator, especially since she's so fluent in Farsi and we had the opportunity to talk to each other in uh, Persian. Um, I must say that um, I arrived yesterday afternoon and uh, your colleagues have been extraordinarily kind and welcoming to you. And I will uh, recommend to everybody in Washington to just accept with closed eyes anytime they receive an invitation from the foundation. Um, thank you for coming. It's not, uh, it's raining outside, so I know it takes a big effort to make it to a lecture. Uh, during uh, rainy uh, season and the rainy day. Um, I'm going to talk about Iran's uh, foreign policy and then move on to cover Iran and the US. Uh, where foreign policy is concerned, Iran seems hardly ever out of the news or even of the front page headline. I remember one day a colleague of mine who runs at the Wilson Center, the Latin America program, complaining that Latin America never makes it to the front pages of the Times or the Post. And I looked at him and I said, oh, what a joy. I wish I would wake up one morning and Iran was not in the front pages or even in the middle pages of these, of the newspapers. Even as we speak now, Iran is engaged in negotiations over its nuclear program with the so-called P5 plus one, the five members of the Security Council plus Germany, uh, negotiations to which the Obama administration has accorded an urgent priority. Iran is a major player in the Syrian crisis and along with Russia, one of the two major supporters of the embattled Syrian president, Bashar Assad. In Lebanon, Iran is the sponsor of Hezbollah whose military clout is perhaps greater than that of the Lebanese army. Uh, Iran has considerable influence over Iraq's prime minister, Nouri al-Maliki, and with more than one Iraqi political party. As you know, Israel regards Iran, particularly its nuclear program, as an existential threat. And Iran's regional role and ambitions are a cause of serious concerns to the Arab states of the Persian Gulf. A WikiLeaks document reveals that in 2008, the Saudi king urged uh, the US ambassador Ryan Crocker and the military commander General Petraeus to cut off the head of the snake the snake meaning Iran. Iran remains the target of severe US and European financial and banking sanctions, and it remains on the US list of state sponsors of terrorism. Uh, what to make then of this middle-sized country, certainly no economic or military powerhouse, playing such an oversized role in the region and in the foreign policy concerns of the US and also of its allies. 
Iran's foreign policy is shaped and driven by two major forces. On the one hand, Iran is ambitious to play a major regional role and to assert its right to a seat at the table on major regional decisions. On the other, it's a country that feels insecure, surrounded by enemies. This has made for a foreign policy that is proactive and confident and also reactive and defensive. And I'm repeating, proactive and confidence and also reactive and defensive. In addition, Iran's leadership is divided between the hardliners who believe Iran can advance its national interests, security, and regional ambitions only in confrontation with the US and the West, and moderates who believe these same goals are better achieved in cooperation with the West and closer integration with the international community. Of this, I will say more later in my remarks. Um, it is useful, I think, to understand how Iran views its place in the Persian Gulf and in the large Middle East region. Iranian elites, whether in or out of government, share a common view of Iran's regional importance. By virtue of its size, its history, and its considerable resources. Besides, what happens in the neighborhood, say in Iraq, in the smaller Arab states of the Persian Gulf, or in Afghanistan, even in Pakistan, impinges on Iran's vital security and economic interests. Not surprisingly, the governing elites believe, or at least desperately want international recognition of Iran's regional standing. They want a seat at the table when major decisions are made, for example, regarding regional security or regional trade. In addition, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, sees the Islamic Republic as the only country in the region and perhaps in the entire developing world that is willing to stand up to the great powers, and particularly the United States, and what he considers to be its hegemonic ambitions. In addition to a conflict over political power, he believes Iran and the Islamic world to be engaged in a defensive war against what he calls the Western cultural onslaught, a war in which the survival and assertion of Iran's cultural and Islamic identity is at stake. In this confrontation, Ayatollah Khamenei also aspires to a role, not only as a leader of Iran Shiites, but of Shiites everywhere, not only of Shiites, but of all Muslims, not only of Muslims, but of the third world in general. Ayatollah Khamenei's personal aspiration thus reinforce a more traditional Iranian claim to regional leadership. And interestingly, in opposing what he considers America's hegemonic aspirations, Ayatollah Khamenei is not alone. Both China and Russia, each in its own way, seek organized blocks of countries that challenge America's vision of the new world order. At the same time, Iran's leaders see themselves as living in a hostile environment. The United States maintains a sizable naval presence in the Persian Gulf, much of it aimed at Iran, and it has naval bases or a military presence in a number of Persian Gulf countries, 
It also has a military presence or bases along Iran's periphery in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and in Central Asia, and until recently also in Iraq. Turkey is a NATO member. The Arab states of the Persian Gulf, despite Iran's repeated attempts to woo them, remain suspicious of Iran and are allied to Iran's principal enemy, the United States. Indeed, they seek America's military protection against Iran. I gained a direct sense of this palpable Iranian fear of encirclement by the United States and its allies when I was in prison in Iran in 2007. My interrogators repeatedly pointed to the American military presence all along Iran's border to emphasize why their suspicion of people like myself who ran a program on the Middle East at a think tank in Washington was entirely justified. I also learned from these interrogations how much the Iranian security apparatus feared American attempt to bring about a velvet revolution in Iran through the use of the opposition and the instigation of mass protest. Uh, a lot of people wonder why in 2009, when there was a protest movement against the um, result of the elections, uh, presidential elections in Iran, the government decided to deal with uh, protesters with uh, uh, harshness and brutality. The reason was precisely that. Once people came out in the street and they were young people, the children of the revolution, um, the regime believed that this is the velvet revolution that overthrew governments in the Ukraine and in the Georgia and in Georgia, and it's better to stop it now. Um, it is also no secret that in addition to Israel, several Arab states in the Persian Gulf uh, have been urging the United States to deal much more uh, harshly and much more, um, uh, I would say, uh, even go as far as talking about bombing uh, Iran's nuclear installations. Uh, there are members of Congress who think in the United States along the same lines. And while uh, President Obama has first and foremost taken the diplomatic route in trying to resolve America's problem with Iran's nuclear program, he has said repeatedly that all options are on the table, <clears throat> and this presumably includes military options. Iran's sense of being under constant threat, even if the problem is partly of its own making, is hardly a figment of its imagination. Moreover, Iran sees itself living in an unstable neighborhood. Afghanistan could easily relapse into warlordism and disorder. Even the West fears for Pakistan's long-term stability, and Pakistan has nuclear weapon. Iran's principal Middle East ally, Bashar Assad of Syria, <clears throat> is in a much stronger position than a year ago, but his regime, as you know, remains shaky. In Iraq, terrorist bombing are a daily affair, and Iran's ally, Prime Minister Maliki, faces a major insurgency in Ambar province. Another source of concern is the growing presence of, in the region of radical Sunni jihadist groups, some affiliated with Al-Qaeda. They are active in Iraq, in Syria, and in Lebanon. These concerns explains Iran buildup of a missile capability and its possible, and I repeat, possible quest of a nuclear capability, its buildup of a surrogate military capability in Lebanon 
and its search for allies. To counter what it sees as a threat from a hostile and unfriendly United States, the Islamic Republic has adopted a series of measures. It has carefully cultivated good relations with other major world and regional powers, such as <clears throat> China, Russia, and India. Um, China and India are today major trading partners. <coughs> the volume of trade with China is 45 to $50 billion a year. And Iran is on the verge of signing an oil for good deal with Russia worth $20 billion. The relationship with Russia is particularly important to Iran. Russia helps block UN Security Council resolutions hostile to Iran. It has been principal suppliers of nuclear and missile technology. It provides a market for Iranian goods. The two countries agree on the need to support the Assad regime in Syria, and Iran, for its part, it's very interesting, has refrained from competing with Russia for influence in the former Soviet republics in Central Asia. And it has not condemned uh, Russia's annexation uh, of Crimea, unlike when Russia went into Afghanistan. Both to extend its reach and influence as a counterweight to America and Israel in the region, Iran has also been very effective in acting through surrogates or by promoting and strengthening political or paramilitary groups in nearby countries. The best and most successful example of this is Hezbollah movement in Lebanon, which is practically Iran's creation. Iran's Lebanon involvement and the creation of Hezbollah began in 1982, during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, aimed at the PLO presence in that country. Iran initially sent a small group of volunteers to assist the Palestinians. Not long after that, an extensive program of assistance to Lebanon's Shiite community followed in the form of money and aid to develop a network of schools, nurseries, health clinics, mosques, and the like. This kind of assistance proved very effective in winning hearts and loyalties and strengthening the position inside the Shiite community of leaders favored by Iran. Meantime, assistance for the buildup of Hezbollah military arm continued. The result has been the stationing of what are said to be thousands of short-range missiles aimed at Israel on Lebanese soil. The creation of a fighting force that proved capable of causing Israel considerable headaches when it again sent troops into Lebanon in 2006. And for the first time, a large role for Hezbollah in the Lebanese government. We should also note that Hezbollah has been linked to terrorist bombing against Jewish and Israeli targets in Argentina and the 1996 bombing of the Khobar Tower apartment complex in Saudi Arabia, which has American military personnel. This same pattern of sponsorship and use of surrogate was repeated after the fall of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. This time, Iran's chosen instrument were a well-established Shiite movement led by the highly respected Hakim clerical family, but also a young radical Shiite cleric, Muqtada Sadr, who equally comes from a very distinguished clerical family. Sadr was fiercely opposed to the American presence in Iraq. Once again, Iran, a majority Shiite country, worked through fellow Shiites. Once again, it used extended assistance in the form of social welfare projects to win favor and influence. Once again, 
it helped create a local paramilitary force, this time under Muqtada Sadr. Iran later reigned in Sadr and has sharply cut back on the support it gives him. But it no longer needs him. The Iraqi prime minister has very close ties to Iran. The creation of these nodes of influence in Lebanon, in Iraq, in the Gaza Strip, in Syria, serves, of course, to extend Iran's influence far beyond Iran's borders. It also gives Iran leverage. Armed Hezbollah forces in Lebanon and Palestinian movement in Gaza, supported by Iran, are a thorn in Israeli side. It is as if Iran was, was saying to Israel and the US, if you try to isolate me, to marginalize me, sanction me, and create trouble for me, I can create trouble for you too. Iran was not invited, as you know, to the multi-party Geneva talks aimed at finding a solution to the civil war in Syria. Actually, Ban Ki-moon had invited Iran to come to Geneva, but uh, the Syrian opposition refused to attend the talks if the Iranian would appear in the, at these negotiations. So then Secretary Kerry suggested that Iran should participate as an observer and Mr. Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, rejected it immediately. On the other hand, everyone recognizes a solution, if at all possible, for Syria will require the support of both Russia and Iran. The creation of these nodes of influence has also become part of Iran's defensive doctrine. A commander of the Revolutionary Guards recently explained it this way, that under the orders from the Supreme Leader, Iran has established its line of defense well beyond its own borders. Now, let me move on to Iran and the United States. With no other countries have relations been so fraught, so difficult as Iran's relation with the United States. Under the Shah, Iran and the US had excellent and very close relations. This these soured almost immediately after the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Diplomatic relations were broken off in 1980, and today, 35 years later, they still have not been restored. The reasons are fairly obvious from the Iranian perspective. Number one, the men who overthrew the Shah in 1979 came to power with already strong anti-American sentiments. The US had been the Shah's ally. America, in the view, had kept the Shah in power, provided him with arms, reinforced his autocracy, was complicit in the Shah's program of westernization. Number two, after the revolution, Iran's leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, used anti-American sentiments to solidify the revolution. Opposition to an independence from America became a deeply embedded pillar of revolutionary ideology. Number three, the students who seized the American embassy in Tehran in 1979 and held American diplomat hostage for 444 days did so precisely to prevent a resumption of normal US-Iran ties and what they regarded as Iranian subservience to America. And they became national heroes. And some of you may recall that the hostage taking took place after a meeting between the then prime minister of Iran, Mr. Bazargan, and Zbigniew Brzezinski the National Security Council advisor to um, President Carter. 
Um, number four, America support for Saddam Hussein in the bitterly fought eight-year Iran-Iraq war, a war in which Iraq was the aggressor, will not be easily forgotten in Iran. And number five, in addition, of course, have been the many ways in which, from Tehran's perspective, the US has sought to damage Iran. Sanctions have been in place almost for 30 years and have grown increasingly severe. The US has sought to isolate Iran, deny trade, investment, and technology. It has labeled Iran a state supporter of terrorism. It has sought to reduce its regional influence and to exclude it from regional councils. Now, from the American perspective, first, Iran, since the revolution, has been viewed a destabilizing element in the region and a threat to America's allies in the Persian Gulf. One reason for US support for Saddam Hussein in the later stages of the Iran-Iraq war was fear of what an Iranian victory might mean for America's allies in the Arab states of the Persian Gulf. Number two, Iran has supported extremist groups such as Hezbollah in Lebanon, as I mentioned, Hamas in Gaza Strip, and both are obstacles to Palestinian-Israeli peace, and Hezbollah has been implicated um, in bombing against American, Israeli, and Jewish targets. Third, Iran, in America's view, seeks to acquire nuclear weapons, a goal which at least three American presidents have declared unacceptable. It is also the case that over the years, there have been several efforts on both sides to engage, to resolve differences, and take steps towards normalizing relations. Iran's President Rafsanjani effectively sided with the United States in, and its allies during the first Gulf War and offered a multi-billion dollar deal to the American oil firm Conoco, which was then vetoed by President Clinton. In 1997, President Khatami called for a dialogue between the Iranian and the American people. And it was clear at the time that he intended people-to-people -people exchanges as a step towards government-to-government -government exchanges. Iran also played a key and helpful role, along with the US, in putting together the interim Afghani government immediately after the overthrow of the Taliban. President Clinton, we know, was eager to reach out to Iran and even wrote directly but confidentially to the Iranian president on two occasions. His Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, in a much touted speech, reached out to the Iranian people. And President Obama came to office clearly hopeful that he could engage Iran in a meaningful way on a broad range of issues. Unlike President George W. Bush, he used the language that implied recognition of the Islamic Republic. For the first time, he addressed in a message on the occasion of the Iranian New Year to the Iranian people and its leadership. Until then, every single American president who had sent a message to the Iranian people had ignored the mentioning the leaders of Iran. He allowed a high State Department official to participate in talks the Europeans were conducting with Iran over the nuclear issue. He even hinted that the U.S. might accept some form of in-country nuclear fuel enrichment by Iran, a sticky issue between the two countries. Yet, every one of these attempts failed. There were perhaps missed opportunities and missed signal. When one side was ready, the other side was not. There was a failure on both sides to build on those occasions. On Afghanistan or Iraq, 
when the two countries seem to be able to work towards the same end. And we know the many objections that each side has regarding the other policies and behavior. Still, one must ask why the differences between the two countries have proven so intractable, the obstacles so resistant to removal. It appears to me something more is involved there than individual issues. Say the removal of sanctions or a formula that would satisfy both sides over Iran's nuclear program. We need to consider whether the differences between the two countries are structural and fundamental and run much deeper than is generally supposed. First, the two countries are pursuing two very different visions of the structure of power and influence in the region, principally in the Persian Gulf, but also in the larger region, including Iraq, Afghanistan, and Lebanon. Iran sees itself as a great regional power, deserving a place at the table in discussions on regional security, the future of Iraq and the future of Afghanistan and Syria. America's policy is directed at excluding Iran from a significant role in the region. Second, Iran's officials, particularly the supreme leader, who is basically the ultimate decision maker in Iran, envisions a new world order in which America's role and influence will be greatly diminished and in which the UN Security Council power will either be diminished or the membership of the council itself will be broadened to give greater voice and role to the countries of the third world in which countries like Iran will play a much larger role in shaping international issues. In brief, America and Iran have striking different visions of the desirable world and regional order. Third, it appears to me that opposition to the state of Israel, to its very existence, has become a pillar of Iranian foreign policy. There are a number of reasons for this, but Iran's anti-Israel pro-hardline Palestinian stance remains a serious obstacle to an Iran-US rapprochement. Fourth, Iran's leader Ayatollah Khamenei is well aware that his anti-Israeli, anti-American rhetoric resonates powerfully with the Arab street. Ayatollah Khamenei, in fact, has said that Iran's standing and prestige in the Middle East and among the people of the Third World derives precisely from the willingness of the Islamic Republic to stand up to America, to oppose America's attempt, in his words, to maintain its hegemony and to impose its political security and cultural preferences on people everywhere. Finally, <clears throat> Ayatollah Khamenei has remained extremely skeptical that Iran will derive any benefits from negotiations, let alone relations with the US. He is highly suspicious of American motives. He believes nothing came of the gestures of goodwill and cooperation Iran made towards the US in the past. And he believes that what the US wants in exchange for engagement is an abandonment by Iran of all the policies and positions that are important to it. Even more, he believes that while the US has focused on Iran's nuclear program, in fact, the US desires the total dismantlement of the Islamic Republic. Is it any wonder that again and again attempts by the two sides to reach out to one another have failed? While 
the US and Iran differ on many issues, it has been the suspicion that Iran is aiming at a nuclear weapons capability that led the United States to impose a set of severe economic banking and financial sanctions on Iran. These sanctions began under the administration of the second President Bush and have been sharply ramped up under President Obama. And the administration has succeeded, as you know, in securing support for these sanctions, not only from its European allies, but also more grudgingly from China and Russia. The negative impact of these sanctions on the Iranian economy has been severe. Oil exports have been cut in half, denying Iran several billion dollars a month in, reven in oil revenues, severe restrictions on dollar transfers to Iran mean that Iran cannot even gain access to its own money, of which as much as $100 billion has piled up in foreign banks. Iran's businessmen have difficulties in opening letters of credit or importing badly needed machinery, spare parts, and raw materials. Iran's currency has lost two-thirds of its value against the dollar in the last two years. <clears throat> After several years of moderate growth, Iran's economy actually shrank last year. More than any other consideration, it is the sanctions that persuaded the Iranian leadership less than a year ago and under a new government to return to the negotiating table over its nuclear program. Uh, now, as I have mentioned, Iran's government elites are, in fact, divided on all these foreign policy issues. Iran's supreme leader and his hardline conservative allies seem to take the view that Iran is locked in a perpetual struggle with a hostile United States. But there are pragmatists in the Iranian governing establishment who believe Iran can achieve its aims, <clears throat> both for domestic prosperity and regional influence, by working with and not in opposition to the West. When these moderates have been in office, Iran's foreign policy has been characterized by a strong strain of pragmatism. Thus, Iran effectively sided with the US and its allies, as I said earlier, during the 1990 Gulf War and when the US led a coalition to force Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Iran played an effective role alongside the United States in bringing together the Afghan world warlords to establish a coalition government after the overthrow of the Taliban in Afghanistan in 2001, and actually Mr. Zarif, the current foreign minister, was Iran's representative in this negotiation. Uh, while Iran's behavior causes considerable and perhaps exaggerated alarm in the Persian Gulf Arab states, it is also true that Iran has often reached out to the Arab states of the Gulf seeking to calm the fears of Saudi Arabia and its neighbors. And it is notable that Iran has maintained excellent relations with Oman and Qatar. The Sultan of Oman, in fact, has often acted as an intermediary between the United States and Iran. This first secret talks over the nuclear issue happened in Oman when Under Secretary Burns met, I believe, with Mr. Arakchi, and the story just was leaked out a couple of months ago. The Sultan of Oman helped relay a message from President Clinton to then Iranian President Khatami, and he appears to have been instrumental in the release of the three American hikers who were imprisoned 
for almost a year in Iran. The election of President Rouhani represents once again the return to office of the pragmatist and the moderate reformist to office. Rouhani came to office by persuading voters he could address and resolve the nuclear issue, end Iran's international isolation, improve the economic lives of Iranians, and ease political control on society. Since his election 10 months ago, some political prisoners have been released, and the press and political organizations enjoy a bit more freedom. But Rouhani has devoted his principal energy to the nuclear negotiation with the P5 plus one, which he reopened as pers and has pursued in earnest since his election. This strategy is quite understandable since resolving the standoff with the West over Iran's nuclear program is the key to much else he wishes to accomplish. With the resolution of the nuclear issues, sanctions on Iran can be lifted, Iran's severe economic problems can be addressed, foreign investment might be attracted to the country, and with foreign investment, the level of unemployment will probably decrease. An agreement on the nuclear issue would permit Iran and the US to address the many other issues on which they differ. The end of sanctions would open the door to much needed foreign investment. Moreover, success in solving the nuclear issue will be highly popular and will strengthen Mr. Rouhani's hand on the domestic issues he wishes to address. The serious and structural economic problem Iran faces and the easing of restrictions on the press, freedom of speech, and on political activities. The obstacles President Rouhani faces, however, are substantial. In the nuclear negotiations, considerable progress was achieved on the broad framework of an agreement, but now, the negotiations have to tackle the hard details of a final understanding. Any nuclear deal is going to require Iran to cut back substantially on its nuclear program and giving up or shutting down facilities and equipments already in place is going to be a tough pill to swallow. The Supreme Leader has so far allowed the nuclear negotiations to go forward, but has publicly said he is skeptical they will achieve anything. As late as today, in an, on the occasion of his 25th anniversary of becoming the Supreme Leader, when talking about America, uh, Mr. Khamenei said that he believes that America is up to all sorts of mischiefs. On the other hand, you have the Revolution Guards commanders, along with other elements on the right, who have the, expressed their unhappiness with the fact that these negotiations are taking place at all, and fear Iran's team will give away too much and obtain too little in uh, return. When Mr. Rouhani addressed uh, a gathering uh, yesterday in Tehran, there were people uh, demonstrating against him, asking for more transparency about the nuclear uh, negotiations. President Rouhani faces obstacles on his domestic agenda as well. Any attempt to deal with Iran's economic problem will threaten the interests of the revolution regards who are deeply involved in the economy and of the oligarchs who dominate it. Economic reform in its initial stages could also hit the pockets of many Iranians. Finally, and I'm going to end now, the security services and the judiciary 
are certain to oppose any political liberalization. In fact, they are doing so already. Thus, while moderate pragmatists are back in office in Iran, both at home and abroad, President Rouhani has his work cut out for him. Thank you. Regarding um, the negotiations and uh, between the United States and Iran, you know, the interim agreement uh, took also several months, and now we know that um, in the last meeting in Geneva, it almost uh, fell apart because the French foreign minister stomped out of the meeting saying that he was not going to put his uh, signature to the deal. And now uh, Mr. Zarif has talked about that event and said we discussed it among the Iranian group and finally they came with a solution that was acceptable to the P5 plus one. But that was the easy part of the agreement. I think what they are, they started discussing in Vienna yesterday are the technical issues. And the main, I think, point of disagreement at this stage still is the number of centrifuges in Iran and between, uh, I mean, and the discrepancy seems vast. Um, on the one hand, the P5 plus one was talking about 4,000 centrifuges, while they were saying 4,000, uh, the Iranian head of the Atomic Energy Commission in, in Iran, Mr. Salehi, was talking about eventually Iran having access to 30,000 centrifuges. So it's, it's easy maybe to reach a sort of a common agreement between 10,000 and 4,000, but 30,000 and 4,000 is quite vast. So one is the centrifuges. The second is the future of, um, you know, uh, Iraq, for example. And uh, then uh, the Iranian have made it clear and uh, both the supreme leader Mr. Zarif, the president, have repeated that Iran will not give up its nuclear research. It's going to continue with research, you know, even if they come to whatever agreement they come, research is going to say. Thirdly, uh, I think the P5 plus one, including the United States, of course, would like to discuss the missile program of Iran, but Iran has you know, made it clear that the missile program is off the table. At this stage, they are just going to speak and negotiate over the nuclear program, and the missile program of Iran is not part of that. So I think these are the obstacles. Having said that, I believe there is a goodwill on both sides to reach a deal preferably by the 20th of July. But, I mean, the realists believe that the 20th of July is much too close and both sides have to agree on an extension. But ideally, you know, within that six months or three months or whatever period that extension period is going to be, they will be, they should be able to reach a deal because both in Iran, the opponents to such a deal are becoming impatient. Mm -hmm. So is the United States Congress. They are also becoming impatient. And, uh, you know, we have to remember that at the end of the day, if there is a deal, the Iranian parliament has to approve that deal. 
and the Iranian parliament, it's still the parliament that was elected under Mr. Ahmadinejad. So it's not going to be that easy either. So the sooner they can have a deal and make use of the goodwill momentum they have created in Iran, it will help. <laughs>
Um, I personally don't think that sanctions uh, should be imposed on governments, but there are those who would argue that had it not been for the sanctions and the effect of it, Iran would have not come to the table. Actually, um, um, Iran and India have had very good relation and the volume of uh, trade between, um, I think, India and Iran is, I don't know, I'll just give you the figure. Um, it is 15 in 2012, 2013, despite the sanctions and so on, the volume of trade between India and Iran has been $15 billion. And I believe the United States uh, granted a number of waivers to certain countries to continue dealing with Iran. I think this included Japan, India, China, certain companies in the, so the Iranian really feel that they, they are very comfortable with dealing with India and they have had very close relations. And uh, I remember there was one occasion that um, when the IAEA voted against Iran, um, India voted with the IAEA majority, the Iranian were in a state of shock because they had not, because of the close relationship between the two countries, they had not expected this to happen. And I believe that with the countries that Iran has had good relations, this government will try and expand the, especially the trade. So Mr. Rouhani, Zarif, and so on will do that. The United States is quite popular among the Iranian people. You know, it's very interesting to uh, the countries of the Persian Gulf, the people in the Arab world uh, are not very fond of the United States. The leadership is very close to the United States. In Iran, it's the opposite. The people express favorable sentiments toward the United States, but the leadership did not. Um, my sense is that even if we have a nuclear deal, even if we have a nuclear deal, this does not mean that Iran and the United States will have political relationship. They will expand or they will, you know, renew their economic relationship. But for the life of me, I cannot see that you will have the American embassy back in Tehran the flag, the United States flag up there. Even as I said earlier today or yesterday, the Supreme Leader was very tough on America. And again, he, he has mentioned that uh, they don't intend to have diplomatic relations now. So that's uh, you know one part of it. Whether the attitude of the people in the United States have changed towards Iran, no. I think Iran, it's, it's very interesting. In polling that has been done, people would like the Obama's administration to come to an understanding over the nuclear deal. But then the next question is, do you feel favorable towards Iran? The answer is no. So the memory of the hostage crisis is still very vivid. And every time you think you will overcome it, something else happens. Another American is put in jail. The three hikers were in jail. Now there is an American Iranian Marine sitting in jail. You know, so there are all these little things that affect the ordinary American. So I, I just think that while they want 
a deal with Iran because they don't want another war in the region. You know, they don't want another American involvement in the region. They necessarily don't have a favorable attitude towards Iran. This is how I see it. Um, Mr. Ambassador, that has been the question I've been asking myself a lot, that after some time, every revolution settles down. But in Iran, it seems that for 35 years, we have been in a perpetual and a continuous state of the revolution. And my sense is that as long as the people who were instrumental, the generation of Ayatollah uh, Khamenei, who were instrumental in uh, starting this revolution or running the country, Iran will be in a revolutionary mood. But once, uh, I think, you have the younger generation who are very well connected, very well educated, come to power, this doesn't, I'm not talking a regime change because I personally don't see a regime change in Iran, but I see a modification and opening from within the system, you know. And I think once these people come to power, then you will see that Iran will settle, the revolutionary fervor will settle down. That's how I see it. But whether it will happen in five years' time or 10 years' time, I don't know. But you know, I mean, this is how I see the future for so, you know. First of all, I think if you see any change in Iran, it is thanks to the women. The women in Iran are the ones who have stood up to the government for the last 35 years. I mean, they have not been inhibited, they have not been frightened, they continue, they push for change, and they insist on being part of the system. So this is, you know, what the, the role of the Iranian women has been. Um, Mr. Rouhani, in his campaign, promised to appoint women to his cabinet. Um, he was not able to do so because I think he knew that parliament would reject it because, um, but he appointed three women as vice president and he appointed uh, three women as governors of very small uh, states, you know, in, in Iran, which is a new thing. I mean, Vice Khatami appointed two women vice president, Ahmadinejad had a pres uh, women vice president, and oddly enough, Ahmadinejad, whose attitude was always in your face, managed to convince parliament to vote for one woman as his minister for, um, minister of health. But when she became unruly, he fired her. So Iran had a minister for a short uh, period of uh, time. Um, but um, the problem is that the regime, the hardliners in the regime feel that they cannot control the woman. 63% uh, of entering classes at Iranian universities are women. And so parliament debated for a while the idea of introducing quota in favor of men. Then they decided to bar women for certain fields of education and um, so for example, just to give you an example, hypothetical, at the Free University, Azad University in Tehran, uh, women, let's say, could not study English literature, while at the same university in a branch in Esfahan, 
They could study English literature, but could not study engineering. So, you know, they, they have been trying to discourage women for going into higher education. And within that context, they abolished um, the family planning program in Iran, which was one of, it was the most successful in the world because they had reduced the birth rate to 1.2 which was unbelievable you know, for Iran. But now the supreme leader uh, is very concerned about the aging of the Iranian population. And therefore, they closed down the family planning program. They are uh, encouraging women to get married at an earlier age. But you know, although the age of marriage in Iran by law is 13, the mean age of marriage is 26. So, and again, women who are better educated than men don't want to marry uh, men who are less educated than them. So you also have a whole generation of single women who go out and want to live on their own. So the whole society is changing because of the women. My sense is that Mr. Netanyahu is, I don't think he's going, Israel is going to attack Iran. I think Israel doesn't mind if the United States attacks Iran. You know, that's a different story. But I think that if there is an agreement, a final deal between Iran and the P5 plus one, including the this will include the United States. The United States will convince and give all sorts of assurances to Israel that there is going to be very strict inspections and verification by the IAEA regularly to make sure that uh, Iran does not start its program again. This is how I read it because um, even in Israel, as you have probably followed, there are different voices. There are a, a number of former uh, Mossad chiefs and, uh, and intelligence uh, chiefs have come out and say Iran is not on the verge of developing a nuclear bomb. So there are different voices coming out of Israel too. But um, from what we hear, in Washington, which is openly announced by State Department, at every stage of the negotiations, the Americans have briefed the thing, have briefed the Israelis, so they know exactly what is going on. So hopefully, if there is a deal, then the Israelis will go along, but they will insist on a very strict respect of respecting the uh, clauses of this agreement. But you know, as I said, the Iranians are not going to, at least at this stage, they say they will not negotiate their missile program. And as I mentioned in my presentation, there are thousands and thousands of missiles in southern Lebanon in the hand of Hezbollah aiming at Israel. And so, um, so the Iranians will not discuss, maybe at a later stage, yes, but not now. So I think it is the United States has to convince Israel that it will not, you know, it will not let Iran after a deal become militarized, you know. And also, again, living in the US, I don't get a sense that people have the stomach for another war in the Middle East. That is also very important. I mean, look, the optimist in me wants a peaceful <laughs> solution. And why not? It, everything is possible. Look, you have a team in Tehran who wants a peaceful solution. And you have a president in the United States 
who believes that there can be and should be a peaceful solution to this problem. But um, we just have to wait and see. And that's why I think because they are not sure whether they can get a deal by the 20th of July, all sides are not talking about an extension. And the extension goes from six months till the end of the year. So we just have to see. Don't forget that, you know, I mean, the US is having uh, congressional elections coming up. And they might, the Democrats might easily lose the Senate. And if the Senate goes, I mean, even if there is a deal, ratification is not going to be so easy. And uh, same in Iran, if, it drags, if they drag it too long, the opponents will just you know, continue uh, you know, their opposition to peaceful or no peaceful deal.